morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today uh, for this um, fascinating presentation on Papuan Lives Matter. I am Tamara San, director of the Al-Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, Washington, DC, uh, hosting today's presentation. The Center for Muslim Christian Understanding was established in 1993 with a focus on the study of the history and political implications of Muslim Christian interactions. Center for Muslim Christian Understanding faculty conduct research, teach, lecture, and publish widely on Muslim communities worldwide with particular emphasis on their intercommunal relations. We serve as consultants to governments, NGOs, and civil societies globally. In 2005, we created the Malaysian Chair for the Study of Islam in Southeast Asia. Since then, we've hosted annually an array of scholars of Southeast Asia, including Kamal Hassan, Osman Bakar, and Anwar Ibrahim. This year, with the challenges of travel posed by the pandemic, we initiated a collaboration with the Asian Studies Program and the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs to virtually host two postdocs working on ethno-religious violence and conflict resolution in Southeast Asia. Working with faculty across the School of Foreign Service, we also launched our Global Anti-Racism Initiative to support the study of the roots and continuing impacts of racism with special emphasis on the legacies of colonialism and slavery and the racialization of ethnic and religious minorities. So we're delighted today to be able to welcome a presentation by one of our visiting postdocs, Dr. Victoria Kusumariati, whose work combines our focus on Southeast Asia and the racialization of ethno-religious minorities. My colleague, Dr. Yuki Tajima, Associate Professor of Asian Studies, will now introduce Dr. Kusum Mariati. Dr. Tajima. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Son. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, Dr. Uh, John Esposito for uh, your leadership, uh, on, you know, both Dr. Son and Dr. Esposito, um, and the generosity of the funding that, that has uh, been able to support um, these these fellows, um, as well as to uh, Dr. Michael Kessler of the Berkeley Center uh, for his uh, partnership uh, in this initiative. It's it's extremely exciting, um, and uh, on behalf of the Asian Studies Program, uh, we're very grateful to uh, sort of have this partnership in the Georgetown community because um, it allows us to to bring in and support uh, fantastic early career scholars such as. Uh, Dr. Kusuma Ariati and uh, Dr. Jessica Sudirgo, who uh, we heard from last week. Uh, so this is uh, ex extremely exciting for all of us in Asian studies um, and the broader Georgetown uh, community. Um, so as uh, Dr. San was uh, talking about, um, uh, this initiative really was sort of a, a late uh, development um, during the summer, actually, um, because of uh, the COVID uh, sort of pandemic. And um, at the same time, as we all know, uh, we had the Black Lives Matter um, uh, movement really sparking many much needed uh, conversations on, on race uh, as well as ethnicity. Um, and so we actually had a, a, a very large um, response from our students uh, across Georgetown to uh, try to um, unpack a lot of these issues and try to make real um, sort of change towards uh, racial justice. Um, and uh, one of the things that um, really stood out when we were sort of uh, uh, trying to recruit our postdocs um, was uh, that their research was able to talk to some of these very topical themes. Um, and so Dr. Kusumariati's uh, uh, path-breaking work um, really sort of lands in, in an amazing sort of sweet spot of a lot of issues that really um, are so important to, to our, our fraught times right now. Um, one of the issues that our Asian studies students have, have been sort of asking more coverage of is um, 
the issue of anti-blackness or anti-black racism in in Asia, which is oftentimes um, sort of marginalized in, in scholarship. Um, and what Veronica's pathbreaking work really does is it, it illustrates the relevance of uh, black consciousness movements in Asia um, and, and really sort of um, highlights um, or even shines a light on uh, this very uh, understudied conflict um, on the Eastern part of, um, of Indonesia. Um, and it's, it's in fact, uh, not just poorly understood globally, but also even within Indonesia. So um, it's a real privilege to have uh, Dr. Veronica Kusmariati here, uh, both as our postdoctoral fellow, uh, but also um, presenting today. Uh, so just briefly, um, Dr. Kusmariati, she received her uh, PhD in anthropology from Harvard University in 2018, uh, where her research, which was based on uh, painstaking, meticulous, and courageous fieldwork and archival work in West Papua, um, trying to sort of understand the roots and dynamics of the Free Papua movement. Um, and uh, currently that project is being converted into a book manuscript and it is going to be a really pathbreaking book um, for the study of, of race and ethnicity and religion and uh, colonialism in uh, East and Southeast Asia. So I think this is going to be a, a very nice preview of that. Um, she is also a true Renaissance woman. Um, and uh, so one of the things that she does on the side is she's an award-winning filmmaker whose film uh, called Expedition Content, which examines some of these colonial uh, forays into, uh, into Papua. Um, was uh, premiered this year at the Berlin International Film Festival. Um, and we're hoping to uh, screen that film sometime this year. Um, and uh, we will sort of provide uh, some, some background on that later on uh, as it becomes available. Um, in addition, she also works for a number of development agencies um, in Indonesia um, on, on gender issues. So she's a true uh, scholar, activist, um, policymaker, and artist, and it's it's a real pleasure to have her. So I'd like to first of all uh, welcome uh, Dr. Kusimariati, and then hand it over to you. Thank you, and and welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Son, and thank you so much for the uh, generous introduction, Professor Tajima. It has been a honor to be part of the Jonestown uh, community, and I'm like really looking forward to uh, have more conversation uh, with uh, the communities about my research. Um, uh, I would like to recognize uh, my debt to the Papuan people who let me uh, study their culture and their societies. I also want to thank Jessica, my colleague here uh, at Jostan, who has presented uh, some of her fantastic work on minorities in Indonesia. And I think, uh, I hope that my presentation today will complement uh, her uh, wonderful presentation a few days ago. Uh, without further ado, uh, can you uh, hear uh, well? Can you hear my voice well? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so uh, I'll start um, first. In August 2019, a group of Papuan students in Surabaya in East Java were subjected to racist epithet. The incident began with a rumor that the Papuan have flushed the Indonesian flag down um, the drain. Another said that they will pull it down and replace it with the Morning Star flag, the flag of Papuan independent movement. In the evening of August 16, the eve of the celebration of Indonesian independence, a crowd of Indonesia, mainly ORMAS, or paramilitary groups, and Indonesian security forces surrounded and screamed at the Papuan and asked them to go back to West Papua. The police also still gases the dormitory for a night. Following this incident, 43 Papuan students were arrested in Surabaya with the accusation of desecrating the national flag of Indonesia. For Papuan, this incident was not new. A similar incident took place in Yogyakarta, another city in Java, where Papuan student Obiko Goyahir was apprehended and arrested uh, in the manner of George Floyd in July 2016. Um, 
in the two instances, the acquisition proved to be unfounded. But the Surabaya incident sparked massive protests both in West Papua and in Indonesia. Next slide, please. Tired with this racism, Papua interpret these abuses within the context of an unaddressed history of humiliation, racism, and the killing of the Papuan by the Indonesian state. The 2019 uh, protests, or uh, called uh, West Papua Uprising, swept across 23 towns in West Papua. This is the easternmost part of Indonesia. 17 cities in uh, Indonesia and three cities overseas during the period of August 19 to September 30, 2019. So it's 2019. After the brutal killing of George Floyd in May 2020, the spark uh, anti-racism protests around the world, Papuan continued this series of protests using the hashtag Papuan Lives Matter. Next slide, please. Black youth of West Papua organized and spoke of their, their faith as Indonesia uh, George Floyd. Elvira Rumkambu, a popular a Papuan scholar, comments, next slide, quote, it is interesting to see just how much Papuan are relating to Black Lives Matter. Papuan share the anger of Black American. Then from Papuan, she turned to we, because she is, in Pap she is a Papuan. And we are demanding now that people around the world, but especially Indonesian, to realize that we have, the, we have the same suffering here, end quote. Those who are familiar with Indonesia have understood that Indonesia has its Papuan problem, that race is one of the most pertinent issues in the long ongoing conflict between the Papuan and the Indonesian state. To some extent, this protest seems to speak to the history of injustice that the Papuan has suffered under Indonesia. West Papua, for instance, is the most militarized area in Indonesia, with human rights abuses committed by the state is a daily occurrence. It also fits with the broader analysis of political economy of West Papua, where although Papua is one of the richest provinces in Indonesia, West Papua occupy the lowest ladder of Indonesian Development Index. Uh, so West Papua, for instance, has the highest poverty rate in the country. Um, the Papuan identification with blackness, however, merit more reflection. The question uh, that we need to ask are why Papuan frame their protest in terms of their identity as black people? Who are the Papuan? Why they have been discriminated against? And why they identify themselves as black, even though Indonesia claim as a race blind society? Why they feel in global solidarity with the Black Lives Matter? And what is the relationship between Papuan uprising and Papuan Life Matter as a especially black social movement and anti-colonial struggle? In this presentation, I will, speak, I will speak about the root of Papuan black identity and its relationship with political race in Indonesia and, and broadly in the global context. The case of West Papua poses a very fascinating question to Indonesianese Asian studies scholar and black scholar. In Indonesian studies and broadly in Asian studies, actually is a Southeast Asian studies, race as an analytic is commonly used to refer to the colonial period where race was the epistemic foundation of colonial societies. So in the work of Furnival and Stoller, Warwick Anderson in the case of Philippines, uh, et cetera, uh, look at the uh, epistemology of race during the colonial period. In Indonesia, especially, race is identical and often used to refer to the ethnic Chinese. The story of West Papua may point to a new emerging field of race study in Asia or Indonesia beyond the Chinese. Secondly, understanding the relationship, relationship between the Papua and the Indonesian state in terms of race may have practical policy value today where countries like Indonesia have denied its racism problem. I will divide my presentation into several uh, iterations here. Uh, so I will uh, provide some introduction uh, to West Papua. Um, I, then I will discuss the political of race uh, in the region. Um, the third, Papuan responses and also production of black epistemologies. Um, and I will conclude my presentation with some reflection on the relationship between Papuan Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter and demand for decolonization. Um, next slide, please. 
as you can see here in the picture, uh, West Papua is the red uh, red one. Uh, is it comprises of two uh, provinces, Papua and West Papua, in Indonesia or Papua Barat. So, um, as you can see here, uh, West Papua is the easternmost uh, and marginalized provinces of Indonesia. It comprises more than 260 uh, ethnic groups, um, and West Papua occupy a uh, about 23% of Indonesian territory. So it's, it's very significant. It's, it's similar to, I think, equal to California. And as of 2020, West Papua population is about 4 million. Uh, nearly half of them are native Papuan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there are a lot of dates here, but I think <laughs> the most important uh, part of, of this introduction is that first, uh, that Indonesia had been, uh, Netherlands is in this at the time, had been under the, the Dutch rule since the 16th century, but West Papua was uh, incorporated into uh, the Netherlands is in this later in the 19th century. So it's quite late. Um, and when Indonesia declared independence in 1945, West Papua was not included. Um, and during 1945 until 1962, actually, um, Netherlands uh, prepared Papua for independence. Um, after Indonesia persuaded the Soviet Union to aid uh, Indonesia ambition to liberate the Papuan from European colonialism, uh, the US uh, was involved. So uh, actually in the 1945, there was a debate among Indonesian nationalists where Hatta, for instance, against uh, in the incorporation of West Papua, but Sukarno uh, and Muhammad Yamin agreed uh, to incorporate West Papua. Of course, this is without consulting the Papuan themselves. Um, so in 1960, uh, 1960, Sukarno approached uh, Soviet Union and then the US then involved because of the Cold War. Um, so uh, the US uh, broker an agreement between the Dutch and Indonesia to transfer West Papua um, to Indonesia. It's called the New York Agreement. And during this process, Papuan were not consulted. Um, According to the agreement, Indonesia was supposed to organize an act of free choice or referendum to see whether the Papuan wanted to be part of Indonesia or not. But under the military regime of Suharto, um, uh, Indonesia invited around 1,025 representatives to put uh, West Papua under Indonesia. So this history uh, uh, is, is very complicated. But I think it's very important because it saves the way that the Papuan seen themselves within Indonesia. And since 1965, the West Papua independent movement uh, or active independent movement is fighting what they call the Indonesian occupation of West Papua. And to cause this independent movement, the Indonesian security forces carry out the longest military operation. So this is the longest operation uh, in the country uh, until today, which result in human rights abuses. Um, and the perception of genocide that marked the international attention to this region. Uh, Against this backdrop, the Papuan use race as an articulation of difference, an articulation of their political and cultural identity. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk about the politic of uh, race in, in West Papua. Next slide, please. Early explorers to West Papua, including Alfred Russell Wallace, distinguished the Papuan from the population of the archipelago that now composes Indonesia. Reports from early scientific colonial expedition demonstrate that the Papuan were understood, how, how the Papuan were understood within the European racial categories. Next slide, please. As you can see here from uh, the Malay archipelago, Alfred Russell Wallace uh, clearly distinguished the, what he called the Malays and the Papuan. And he used this physiognomic, uh, but also uh, uh, mental characteristic to distinguish these two uh, racial group. Um, so uh, for instance, in, in the, the first part, he focuses on the skin, on the hair, but also this, this right, the, the form of continents. But the most important thing I think is that at the end where he says, 
there is as much different, both moral and physical, as between the Red Indian of South America and the Negroes of Guinea on the opposite side of the Atlantic. So this is between the Malays, uh, Indonesian, and the Papua. Uh, back to the previous slide, please. So, well, as while suggesting that Papuan are similar to African to some extent, early explorers also used the word savages, pygmy, or primitive to refer to the Papuan. This map into the larger mapping and categorization of the Pacific into cultural, three cultural sphere that relies on European racial epistemologies. Um, next slide to the map. Next, yes. So uh, the division of the Pacific into three cultural sphere rely on this European racial epistemologies with Polynesia and Micronesia are defined by, by its physical geography. Polynesia, many island, Micronesia, small island, while Melanesia is defined in relation to its racial inhabitant, melanin black. Uh, and since the 1917, uh, since the 17th century, the Papuan had been traded as slaves. Um, the actors that were involved uh, were quite different from, uh, from, from the Atlantic uh, slave trade, in a sense that, uh, of course, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the British were involved, but Indonesian, like Makassar, uh, people from Sulawesi, uh, from Maluku, but also the, the, from the Suwo uh, Sea uh, near the Philippines were also involved. Um, upon the arrival of the Christian mission in the Pacific and especially in West Papua, this combination of, uh, of European uh, white supremacies and their existing knowledge of the Indies and the Pacific uh, play significant roles. The Dutch colonialism rely on this political phrase with the Papuan occupying the lowest ladder of the colonial society in West Papua, while Indonesian and Chinese play the role of colonial and mission mediator. So this is also distinguished West Papua from Indonesia, where the Chinese uh, in Indonesia became the mediator of colonial rule. Uh, in in um, West Papua, um, a lot of in, uh, what we call native, <laughs> native <laughs> ethnic group of Indonesia were also involved. So both Christian mission, uh, Dutch, um, Anglo-American and Dutch colonial state uh, brought teachers and ministers from the Molucas and Minahasa Christian area in Indonesia. So uh, to give sense of this um, also uh, in, play out in the history is that uh, West Papua is the most Christianized area in the, in the country. And the role of Christian um, epistemology of race uh, will be very uh, important, is also very important, but uh, because of the time, I will be happy to talk about that uh, during the Q&A. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next, again. Yeah. So here, uh, the Dutch, as, I'm, as far as I'm aware of, do not use the word black, but pointed to the ethnological and cultural difference between the Papuan and the Indonesian or the Malays or the Asian. In 1962, uh, the Dutch colonial government described the Papuan as follows. Um, they said, quote, it is very improbable that the Papuan form a separate race. Instead, instead they are probably a pairing of the race of the Eastern or Melanesian Negroid. However, this term is also misleading since this ethnic type has very little common with the African Negro. Um, the Dutch colonial government also used uh, the word pygmy to, pygmies to refer to uh, the Papuan who lived in the highland. So in the, in the vocabulary of the Dutch colonial government, Negroid and the Melanesian were used to refer to Papuan racial identities. The idea of Melanesia was discussed in the New Guinea Council a council that, that was established by the Dutch in 1960 to prepare Papuan for their independent for their independent projected to take place in 1975. Um, the use of the term Melanesia also uh, prominent in the participation of West Papua in the South Pacific Commission at the time. It's a regional commission founded by uh, by Western countries, the US, um, New Zealand, etc., to prepare this uh, area for independence. 
in the council, the conversation about their identity as Papuan identity as Melanesian were crucial, not only in regard to the regional politics of the Pacific at the time, but also within the Papuan intellectual circle. In the 1950s and 60s, the Dutch and Australian even talked about the possibility of building a Melanesian federation. This federation was envisioned as an independent entity that would unite Papuan in the East, which was, uh, was under Australia, and in the West, who was under the Dutch, for an independent nation state of Melanesia. The unifying identity would be the race. Um, although it did not materialize, the idea of unity and shared identity as Melanesian between Papuan, uh, Papuan would survive Western and Indonesian political imposition. In the 1980s, for instance, um, uh, Melanesian Spearhead Group, a regional uh, organization, was established uh, uh, especially to accommodate Melanesian political aspiration. So we see here that term Melanesia has moved from a term of denigration, denigration Black uh, Melanesian, to one of affirmation providing a positive basis for contemporary supra-regional identity as well as a formal organization. Again, this history, the Papuan encountered the African-American during World War II, and this to prove to be very historical moment. Next slide, please. Next. Or before. Yeah, um, the role of African American. In an interview with Charles Farhardian in 2000, Nicholas Yue, a Papua nationalist leader trained by the US Army, said, quote, the most important thing that happened in our New Guinea during World War II was the prison of Black American, the Negroes with, uh, who were an engineering battalion that built up Hollandia or Jayapura, the capital city of West Papua in one week time. In one week, they fixed all the road from Tanah Merah to Hollandia. It was done by the Black American. That opened the eyes of the Papuan. You see, Black people can do those things. Before that, only white men were capable, capable of doing such things. Black people were to be humble and not do the important jobs. We were sometimes used as slaves by Indonesia. But in wartime, American Negroes came here. They did everything. There were Black American and under them were white American servants. That was a surprise that opened the eyes of the Papua. Then at once, national feeling came out. We are not Indonesian. Before that, we had very few Dutch. The entire administration was run in the colonial period by the Indonesian, and the Indonesian treated the Papua like slaves, unlike the Dutch." End quote. Um, next slide. You, uh, so uh, these two pictures are, are very interesting uh, to me. Uh, this come from the National World War II Museum in, in the US. And it shows African American, American soldiers walking down runway at Hollandia Airport. Um, it's in the uh, capital city of Papua and the airport is still there. And then the, the right uh, picture is, um, is the engineering battalion that Nicholas Yue referred to. And I think another interview that also very interesting to me is um, the next slide, please. Uh, when he says, it's from the same uh, person from Nicholas Yue. He says that we saw black pilot, black sailors, black in fancy uniform with the bottle of Coca-Cola. Of course, we knew nothing about racial discrimination in the US, Jim Crow, but what we saw opened our eyes. We were always despised, treated like savages not so much by the Dutch, but by the lower administrative official. We always had the bottom on the ladder at the top of the Dutch, then the Chinese, then the hated South Molucan, the Black Dutch, then the Japanese, and eventually the Papua. In 1962, Nicolas Hue um, and other members of Papua, elite member of the New Guinea Council, traveled to Africa to campaign for their independence. Next slide. They brought a pamphlet entitled, quote, Voice of the Negroid in the Pacific to the Negroid Throughout the World. This pamphlet, uh, published in 1962, emphasized their alignment and called for, 
for racial solidarity with pan-African and global black movement. The pamphlet declares, for instance, quote, that New Guinea is New Africa, end quote. Nicholas Yue wrote in the pamphlet, quote, we Papua know that we are independent people. And this is the time we want to fight before the international forum to remain ourselves. We do not want to be slave anymore. We are Papua and want to remain Papua, end quote. This, uh, this statement show on the one hand how Papua again used the colonial term, but leveraged it for their nationalist purpose. This eloquent expression of blackness of the Papua receives any simple explanation about the roots of Papua difference. But we can see that the emergence of blackness in Papua political and cultural discourse is multiscolor in the local, regional, and international level. Next slide, please. So what happened when Papua uh, uh, become part of Indonesia? Uh, this is the third part of the presentation. Um, Indonesia claimed itself as a race blind society. The national slogan, unity in diversity, consider the diversity of ethnicities, religion, and ex cultural expression is the fundamental constitution of Indonesian nation. As I have mentioned earlier, race is not part of Indonesian political lexicon with the exception of the ethnic Chinese. Under Indonesia, Papuan political and cultural identities as black or Melanesian thus was a difficult problem for the nation. For Indonesia, Papua claim to national identity and to black identity are no more than the legacy of Dutch colonialism. Secondly, while Indonesia had been involved in the slave trade with the Papuan and Papuan have been understood by Indonesian nationalists as having ethnological difference, there's a, I, think, I think there is a sincere perception among ordinary Indonesians that Papuan are part of Indonesia, that they are Indonesian regardless of their skin color. Um, and Ben Anderson, I think, amplified this, you know, in Imagine Community, right? <laughs> it's always from Sabang to Merauke. However, in its grammar of rule and practice, Indonesia reproduces and even expands what the Dutch had done in West Papua. First of all, right uh, after the Indonesian arrival, the use of Papua, Papuan, and Melanesia was prohibited during the new order. So any Papuan cannot say that he is a Papuan. <laughs> Secondly, cultural domination and assimilation policy mark the Indonesian role in the region. And any expression or articulation of difference is framed as separatist, separ separatist aspiration from Indonesia. All Indonesian textbooks used in the West Papua give no place for Papuan cultures. Development policy is also oriented toward the supposed supremacy of Japanese culture such as the creation of sawa or rice field in West Papua and the imposition of rice and the denigration of sweet potatoes, uh, uh, Papuan diet, um, denigration that, the, that is, is not a civilized man of food. Um, and third, uh, I think the blatant racism is still professive. Uh, so I quote here a statement from Philip Karma from his wonderful book. You can uh, find it online actually. Uh, so Philip Karma is a nationalist leader, uh, but he went to study in Java in the 80s. And he said, he said um, like this, when I studied in Java, Indonesian consider us Papuan student half animals. They consider us an illustration of Darwin theory of evolution a transitional being from an animal to human. That's how I felt from my college friend in Solo. This is higher education, by the way. This treatment did not come from those who are uneducated, but also those who are highly educated. That's how they treat us, the Papuan. Sometimes people yell at us, monkey, apes, end quote. Next slide, please. Perhaps the best way to understand Indonesian racism over the Papuan is from how the Papuan respond to Indonesian politic of race through popular culture. In the 70s, Papuan youth formed several musical bands with names such as Iriantos Primitives, Black Sweet, Black Papas, Black Brothers, so everything with Black. 
The pop and youth inserted their different identity and the idea of blackness into music, t-shirt, hairstyle, dance, study group, uh, discussion session at the University of Cendrawasi camp campus, the only campus at the time. Next slide, please. So and the, the left side is the University of Cendrawasi. So a term like kribo or frizzy hair or hitam or black were widespread. Um, the right, the right side, uh, they are proud of their frizzy hair and the dark skin. This popularization, popularization of Papuan black identity proved to be bothersome for the Indonesian military administration in West Papua. In an interview with the Jakarta-based weekly publication Tempo, Andi Ayamiseba, the founder of extremely famous The Black Brother, said that an Indonesian official asked Black Brother to replace their name. Um, next slide, please. The name for the Indonesian military official suggests the backwardness of the Papuan people, end quote. But for Black Brothers, blackness, which refer to their skin color, cannot power. After Black Brothers, um, Mambesak, another band led by Papan musician, emerged from the University of Cendrawasi. Next slide, please. Oh, this is also a t-shirt that uh, used by a uh, Papuan student or Papuan activist. Um, so there is a pride, uh, the term pride is from me actually, but um, I can see that uh, they are very proud with their skin color and frizzy hair. Next slide, please. So this is Mambesak, uh, a band that is very popular in the 1980s. And the founder of this, this band called uh, Arnold Ab, who was killed by the Indonesian Special Forces, uh, shared Andi Ayamiseba vision for Papuan identities as Melanesian or as Black. He formulated conception that became popular, popular among Papuan youth, such as Black is beautiful, Black is good, Black is Black. Papuan wore t shirt with this slogan, uh, the T-shirt is their social media. Next slide, please. As Benny Gai, Benny Gai is a, is a reference, um, a church leader, but he went to University of Cendrawasi in, this, in the 80s, uh, 70s, sorry. Uh, he said uh, that Papan student at the time printed t shirt and wore it during sport competition for the commemoration of Indonesian independence. At the time, they were like celebrities. They were proud of their frizzy hair. They wore no can or net bag everywhere. I remember they wore t-shirt, black is good, when they play football in front of the military base in Abipura. The message was, it is okay to be black. It is Indonesian who found it a problem, end quote. Um, it was not a coincidence that Papuan followed the arrest and killing of Bantu Stephen Biko, or Steve Biko, a South African anti-apartheid activist who championed the black consciousness movement in the 1970s. Guy again said, the news of the killing stirred the world. We heard it on the radio, end quote. Next. Here, uh, popular cultures, uh, radio, um, and then t-shirt seem to function as a media of modernity for the Papuan and trans-ethnic national communication. But at the same time, this media uh, play the role as a vehicle of transnational and cosmopolitan radical blackness. The same mode is replicated in the Papua Lash Matter and West Papua Uprising. Next slide, please. The same mode is replicated in the Papua Lash Matter uh, on the left uh, and West Papua Uprising, where the internet play a strong role in galvanizing Papua identification with Black Lives Matter. While global Black political movement have long shared Papua identity, the new movement under Papua Lives Matter show how digital media or the internet have played a powerful role in the spread of anti-racism protests. Um, so I didn't have I don't have a uh, I didn't have a chance to dwell on this, but I'll be happy to talk about the role of the internet um, um, during the Q and A. But uh, during the protest in 2019, actually the Indonesian government shut down the internet in West Papua because of the the power of, of, of media here. All right. So now I'm coming to the end of my presentation.
Um, and um, next slide, please. Um, so to conclude my presentation, I would like to turn to the Black Lives Matter and uh, Pop One Lives Matter. Uh, Pop One identification with Black identity and global Black movement is not new, as I have chronicled earlier. As Pop One have defined their political identity against Euro-American racial epistemologies, and the domination of Indonesian culture or production of difference against what they perceive as Indonesian, Malay, or Asian domination. The emergence of Papuan Life Matter thus can be understood both as specific response, or you may call it local response, to Black Lives Matter. But I also argue that this protest is a continuation of their anti-racism struggle since their encounter with Osider. Uh, one area that I think uh, would be very productive, but I haven't had a chance to explore this, is um, the, I think, Papuan case or Papuan people uh, and their definition of Blackness can contribute of, uh, in the epistemological um, uh, production of Blackness, of global Blackness. Um, so as we return to Elkira's statement at the beginning of this paper, Pop One showed that Black experience of racism is shared across geographical reaches from Minneapolis, San Francisco, LA, New York to West Papua. This point uh, to the global scope of racism as an organizing principles of the global order, but also national order in Indonesia. Papua Lives Matter speak to the history of the Papuan and their encounter and experience with Indonesian racism, which includes the racist criminal justice system where 80 to 90% of the prison population in West Papua are Papuan, even though Papuan only comprise 50% of the total population. This also has something to do with the, uh, what in Indonesia call uh, pasal makar or treason. Um, that is still used. This is a Dutch, uh, Dutch uh, legal system, and still used in Indonesia to bring a lot of Papuan into jail, into the criminal justice system. Secondly, militarization, human rights abuses, amounting to what the Papuan perceive as genocide, and then Indonesian cultural and economic domination. In addition to their black identity, however, Papuan also assume another identity as Christian in a Muslim majority country and in, as indigenous people. So there is an intersectionality of, of identity here as black, indigenous, and Christian. These are the identities uh, to some extent distinguish Papuan from the struggle of African-American in Black Lives Matter. As Papuan Life Matter show, while racism is an important motive, a national nationalist aspiration to have their own nation state is still the main driver of the Pop One Lives Matter. So as you can see here, in addition to the anti-racism protest, they also call for self-determination for West Papua. Next slide, please. In other words, the in other words, uh, the aspiration of, of, for decolonization is the urgent demand of the uh, Pop One Lives Matter. And in this framework, blackness in West Papua has been understood and articulated not only in relation to white supremacy or the legacy of white supremacy, but also post-colonial claim of multiculturalism in Asian societies. This claim rests on the two axes. First, that colonialism is that, that colonialism no longer exists in Asia. And secondly, that racism was Asia colonial past. The case of West Papua seems to challenge both assumption. The question that I want you to reflect on, uh, next slide, are, do we, do we take Papuan epistemological critique that Papuan are still and, con sorry, continue without S, <laughs> are still and continue to be colonized by an Asian country? that there is a very clear uh, clear di uh, distinction between Papua and Mel uh, um, Melanesia and Asia. Um, 
So that's the first question. Secondly, uh, the question also uh, uh, the the question also posed um, whether racism is alive and strong in the so-called post-colonial society in Asia. Um, so I will end here, and I'm looking forward uh, to the conversation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kusumariati, for this uh, brilliant, really, and fascinating presentation. Your work is is inspirational in its um, in its careful research analysis and ability to point out some critical themes in uh, a number of the theoretical structures that we're dealing with, uh, both in the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding and then of course in at the Berkeley Center and in Asian Studies. What I think is so fascinating is that you're, as you're pointing out um, that Proper Lives Matter movement is um, an intersection of the ethno-religious hierarchy that was imposed by the Muslim majority and the Euro-Christian racist hierarchy that was imposed by the colonizers. In both cases, what's at stake is power control of power, uh, control of resources, control of power by a self-defined elite, whether it's Euro-Christians or uh, Indonesian Muslims. The late development of language of race in modern Europe um, was just one iteration of that preceded by in Euro-Christianity, preceded by religious hierarchy it got superimposed, the religious hierarchy had racist hierarchy superimposed upon it. At the root of all of these hierarchies, of course, as I said, is power. Um, Isabel Wilkerson's recent book on caste, using the language mm. of caste, um, mm. is a fascinating way to sort of weed through these various strands to get to the, to the core issues. Who who benefits from this hierarchization? But what's also fascinating here is the parallel between, um, between the West Papuan case and African American case of embracing an identity that used to be used to subjugate a group, mm -hmm. embracing it and using it as an empowering mechanism. Uh, black is beautiful and Black Lives Matter and Papa Lives Matter, um, an empowering mechanism to, again, overturn that power structure because at the root of that embrace of that identity is a liberation movement. The idea is to get out from under the subjugation, whether it's called ethno-religious or racial, it's um, an effort to liberate from subjugation. So really, really fascinating case study of these global historical tendencies. What I wanted to ask you is, um, and to introduce another initiative that the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding is undertaking, which is a new program. I've been working on it uh, with faculty across SFS and across the colleges too, um, the entire university, uh, a new program called Religion, Arts, and Global Affairs, in which we, it's multidisciplinary, of course, but what we do is focus on religious discourse and artistic expression as um, civil society discourse, and in particular, subversive discourse. When the power structures preclude um, overt mainstream intellectual or political discourse because of marginalization and oppression, 
human beings find ways, as Bruce Lee said, like water, <laughs> find ways to express themselves in one way or the other. So religious discourse, the religious discourse that I've studied throughout um, my career is just that kind of expression and it overlaps with artistic expression. And so what I'm driving at is your fascinating example of Mom Bessa, the group that you mentioned in, from the 1980s. Um, and you say that that group is no longer uh, working. The leader of it was- uh, He was killed. He was killed. Yeah. By Indonesian security forces, yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in other parts of the world that I study um, often, we find Palestinian, of course, hip hop music, mm -hmm. and South African and, and South Asian, other parts of South Asia, um, really fascinating modes of discourse. So here's the ask. Would you be willing to do a presentation next semester <laughs> on artistic expression mm -hmm. of this uh, of this essentially liberation movement? Uh, thank you so much for that. And I think my message is very interesting indeed because uh, they grew up from the church, um, an indigenous church. <laughs> Uh, so, which is very interesting if you talk about this, uh, the ethno-religious dimension, because um, of course there's a sense of um, 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 sense of uh, marginalization uh, in terms of religion. But um, but what is interesting in the case of West Papua, uh, most Papua actually do not have any problem with Islam. Uh, uh, to some extent, uh, but of course, because the Christianity has become the most important institution, church is the most in important institution. So really uh, church also become the interlocutor for so many struggle in West Papua in, in terms of, for instance, musical artistic expression, but also the leadership because church leadership in, in some churches are dominated by Indonesian, <laughs> not by Papuan. And Papuan until now cannot become uh, our, our bishop um, in the Catholic Church, <laughs> which raises so many questions, like why Papuan cannot be our bishop in West Papua. <laughs> so the stake is quite high and I'll be happy to share my research on that next semester. Yeah. And actually, there is a fascinating um, parallels in in the U.S. I mean, African Americans mm -hmm. weren't allowed to be even ordained in the United mm -hmm. States until the 1980s. I mean, become mm -hmm. priests in in yeah. the Catholic Church. So, right. um, mm -hmm. fascinating parallels. But again, getting yeah. down to that issue of elites trying to maintain control of power. Um, and those people who are subjugated to whatever the power, however the power structure is articulated, find ways to express the very human need for freedom. So brilliant. Thank you so much. And I will, um, I will pass the baton to Dr. Tajima. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is uh, a brilliant presentation, really. I, I learned so much um, and I study conflict in Indonesia. So this is really eye-opening um, and I'm really looking forward to your book manuscript, which we will promote uh, as soon as it's out. Um, so no pressure. Um, one of the things that um, you really, to my mind, demonstrated um, decisively is um, uh, how socially constructed race uh, was stretching back to uh, European uh, explorers and, uh, and colonists. Um, and, and how a lot of those concepts were um, really adopted um, by the Indonesians um, from independence onward. Um, and what was interesting was, was as you say that um, blackness and Black, black identity was was actually reappropriated, um, and so it sort of was taken from a derogatory term to uh, something that is empowering, um, as as Tamara, uh, Dr. Son mentioned. Um, you also alluded to this this idea that um, under Suharto, 
um, as as Indonesianists know, um, there was an avoidance of sara, so suku agama, uh, suku ras agama antar golongan. So basically, ethnicity, race, um, and and religion and and other identity forms, right? Um, and I wanted to actually ask, um, you know, during the period of uh, democratization, there is a sort of loosening of a lot of these constraints. Um, so what is the significance of being able to explicitly acknowledge, um, you know, different identity types uh, during this, this period? Um, and we, we've seen how these impacts can go both, um, you know, in positive and negative directions. So it'd be interesting to see if you could reflect on that. And relatedly, you know, a lot of the um, discussions of identity conflicts in Indonesia, but also Southeast Asia, they, they revolve around ethnicity. And what your work does is it sort of brings in this element of race or racial identity that um, hasn't been sort of explored that much. I'm interested um, to see what exactly is uniquely different about that layer or that dimension of identity. Um, as you say, there's intersectionality there, right? So what is it that's different um, when you uh, have um, sort of the racial dimension in addition to sort of the typical ethno-linguistic differences that are talked about um, in other uh, conflicts in Southeast Asia. But, and then more recently, um, I wanted to bring your discussion since you alluded to this, but I think you probably have some material um, that you're collecting in real time. Um, as you know, the, in the US, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement brought a lot of the discussion of racial justice um, into the mainstream and, and garnered you know, significant movement in the general population in terms of sympathy and support for issues of, uh, of racial justice that weren't there before. Um, and I'm interested um, whether you've seen uh, a similar movement in Indonesia, um, sort of whether or not the sort of appeals to um, anti-racism um, have resonated uh, in the broader Indonesian public um, and, and sort of seeped into the mainstream uh, to the extent it, you know, we've seen uh, movement in the US. Um, so if you could sort of uh, comment on those, um, we also will, um, you know, don't take too much time on, on my questions, but um, we have a number of other uh, questions that are coming in through the chat. So anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question, uh, please do so in the chat and then I will uh, read them over. Okay, so um, if I could, if we could sort of turn it back to you, uh, Dr. Kusumarati, uh, it would it'd be lovely to hear from you. So thank you so much for, for these thoughtful questions. Um, uh, so the first question about the identity and conflict and um, so identity politics is indeed uh, indeed become very important uh, in post-reform Indonesia or after 1998. And in the case of West Papua, I think it's very interesting that in 2001, Indonesia grant spatial autonomy status to West Papua. And one of the, the, the stipulation in the spatial autonomy law is that recognizing that was uh, the, the category of orang asli Papua or the native Papua uh, who are recognized as ethnically Melanesian. Okay. So this is a very interesting move in from the side of the government that now the government recognized what they call the cultural connection of Papua with the Melanesian world. But the problem is the second part is that now Indonesia used that word Melanesian also to refer to, uh, to population of other three uh, provinces, Nusa Tenggara Timur, uh, uh, Maluku Utara and Maluku. So now they're having Melanesia Indonesia with Melanesia Melindo. And then Indonesia also enroll uh, itself into the Melanesian spearhead group. So this is a very interesting third, uh, move in terms of regional politics. Why Indonesia cares about Melanesian at all? <laughs> so, uh, so this is very interesting in, in, in this uh, international politics at, or regional politics. But in terms of in, in, on the ground in the conflict, I think uh, it's happened a lot with the election or Pilkada, yeah, for instance, uh, or local election where 
only Papuan or ethnically Papuan now can uh, run for uh, for governor, vice governor, and bupati and vice bupati. Uh, so now this become a site of conflict uh, where uh, how you define the the, the Papuans and then there is a lot of for um, uh, a lot of responses from Papuan, for instance, uh, using of course a, a, a patrilineal lineage uh, to define uh, Papuan. So now Papuan are called to respond to a very racist policy actually to. Uh, a, um, in um, in response to the Indonesian government, and this also become root of conflict, particularly with the demand for pemekaran or territorial redivision, and each ethnic group or each group like ask for their own provinces or on uh, uh, kabupaten, etc. So, while on one hand the Papuan identity as a national identity for the Papuan still very strong, I think. There are also a lot of like uh, conflict going on on the ground to how, and then also imperative to define what Papuan is, right? So if, you know, on the skin color and then what, because there is also a lot of like intermarriage between Papuan and non-Papuan. So that's another part. Secondly, I think the West Papuan case is quite specific because the arrival of the settler, or what we call migrants, and there is a very strong sense of identity as a as a indigenous people there. So this where indigenous people, uh, indigeneity plays the role, the role because uh, the stake is high, especially to the land and forest. So. Uh, like resource conflict is happening a lot between Indonesian government, the Indonesian government and Papuan. And Papuan used the word like uh, uh, komunitas adat, masyarakat adat, orang asli Papua, etc. To claim this ownership, right? Uh, and uh, to uh, say no to settler or migrants. Um, and secondly, uh, in response to your question about what is unique about race, uh, as an analytic in uh, in in maybe Indonesian studies or broadly in Asian studies, Southeast Asian studies, I think precisely because West Papua like poses this very interesting intersection. Uh, I mean, is Melanesia part of Asia? Uh, so you, um, I think the the history of the discipline itself, <laughs> Asian studies, and particularly Southeast Asian studies was the product of the Cold War uh, with Cornell University and other un uh, program in Indonesian studies come from that, right? So the, the West Papua is under Indonesia, uh, but West Papua always move away. You know, they want to move away from that. And a lot of studies in West Papua are centered on their culture as Melanesian, right? So ceremonial exchange and things like that, very anthropological. Uh, so I think the analytic of race can open up not only in the, uh, like horizon in area studies, like how we defend Asia or Asian studies, I think, but broadly also like to look at what's going on right now. Um, I think we are called, I saw the website AS um, and, <laughs> and their engagement with Black Lives Matter. I think we are called to see um, and to respond to the ongoing racism that's not only happening in the US, but also a lot of places in Asia. Uh, so I think there's a sincere uh, need to respond to this kind of situation, right? Like for instance, African in China or uh, outsider in Japan. You know? So uh, I think it will help us a lot to enrich the scope of the studies, not only Indonesian studies or Southeast Asian studies, but Asian studies. And then uh, Indonesian, particularly young people, uh, respond well to Black Lives Matter. And it became a, tr a trend actually when just Floyd was, uh, was killed. Um, so a lot of conversation, including among the Indo uh, Chinese Indonesian about how we respond to Black Lives Matter. And then of course, a lot, you know, what they call like social justice warrior. <laughs> um, uh, tell, told them that, well, we have Papuan problem. And Papuan are very savvy, like Papuan, you, Papuan youth are very savvy and, you know, like make use of this, these opportunities to 
to push their own agenda. Um, so this is something that I have to think about, um, which is, um, it's not only that Papua and Life Matter is influenced by this global movement, but how even Papua and Life Matter, I think, shape the, or produce their own epistemology of racism, epistemology of blackness. Um, and I think it will be helpful to understand that in the context of Indonesia, because colorism is not only Papua, but Papua suffered the worst, I think. Like people from Flores or from Maluku also suffer the same thing. Thank Absolutely. you. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so I'd like to use the remaining 20 minutes um, to uh, present some questions to you. Um, I think uh, maybe I'll do them two at a time. Um, uh, so, so we can sort of try to move through them. So the first one is from uh, Professor Mike Green, who's the director of the Asian Studies Program. Um, he says, a wonderful presentation. Could you tell us more about the response from ASEAN on the West Papua situation? Uh, there has been some support for Muslims suffering in the Rakhine state in, Malay, um, in uh, Myanmar. Uh, oh, sorry, in, in, sorry, Rakhine state in Myanmar, in Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, mm. But are there any nodes of sympathy for Christian West Papuans? Does the Papuan Lives Matter movement resonate anywhere else in the region? So that's mm. uh, the first one. Um, and the second one is um, from Filza Avianti. Um, do you think unlearning racism and building race and ethnic consciousness is difficult in Indonesia because the motto Bineka Tungal Ika, so unity and diversity uh, has been co-opted. It puts an emphasis on colorblind politics, subjugating others who are not part of the majority and compel them to adapt. Uh, it also sees diversity as a threat, which is exactly the opposite of the foundational education of race consciousness. All right. Oh, wow. Well. These are very difficult questions. Okay, first, maybe I'll start with the issues one. Thank you, Professor Green. From Asia, from Asia, um, I think there are some uh, sympathetic uh, messages and solidarities from uh, social movement in Malaysia and in the Philippines, for instance. Um, I think. Uh, I think the Philippines also has their, <laughs> has their own indigenous uh, people problem. Uh, while it's not usually framed as a race problem, I think they also share like some, you know, racism or colorism that, uh, that Papuan suffer. But as an institution, ASEAN <laughs> haven't, hasn't done anything as far as I'm aware of, even in, for the Rakhine uh, issues, I think they don't, <laughs> they don't do anything which is very sad. Um, so uh, actually the, the West Papua issues speak better in the Pacific. Um, and that's why I think um, uh, West Papua really ignored uh, Asia, well, like Asia, Asia proper. <laughs> um, so for instance, during the General Assembly uh, in the, in the, at the UN, it's always like the Pacific countries who raise the voices at, uh, against uh, human rights abuses of Indonesia, like Vanuatu or you know, Samoa, Tonga, and things like that. Also the church, the church in Asia, they haven't done anything, but church in the Pacific, the uh, Council of Church in the Pacific really uh, pay attention to this to these issues. So I think this is also that's why I think the Asian question is very important. Like why Asia ignore this problem? Uh, is it because Melanesia is not considered Asia? Is it because of uh, because they are black? It's not. It doesn't conform with the representation of Asia as Malay or you know or Asian. Um, but yeah, so. That's the, the short answer to that. The, the Pacific countries uh, are more uh, focal and active, including New Zealand. I think New Zealand, um, even though they still support the sovereignty of Indonesia in in uh, in West Papua, but for instance, the MSG, the Melanesian Spearhead Group, was uh, is funded by China. <laughs> so this is very interesting, interesting uh, regional issue at play here. Um, Okay, so the second is very challenging question, Rixa. So how to unlearn racism? 
the first part is that to to recognize that there is racism in the first place, <laughs> and I think um, you know uh, Joko Widodo, uh, the president, several weeks ago during the commemoration of the the Tolerance Day or something along that line, said that there is no racial discrimination in Indonesia, there is no ethnic discrimination in Indonesia. So it's very hard uh, if you talk about the state, but if you talk about the people, then we can see that. Um, there have been a lot of effort, including by Chinese Indonesian. I think I have to say this because I think it's very important that the Chinese Indonesian now uh, start to think about this and uh, you know um, that not only see themselves in the in this position, but also relate to uh, to the Papua. Um, but the problem with West Papua is tied to to just this you know like self identification of Indonesia. This is part or parcel of our nation. That's the problem. Um, so even though there is a housing discrimination, a lot of Papan students uh, face housing discrimination in cities like Yogyakarta or Surabaya. I think most Japanese people like me, <laughs> like my neighbors, they don't recognize that it's a racism. It's just like, no. <laughs> so to learn racism uh, call for, uh, con you know, I think for popular uh, anti-racism education and pedagogy. Um, and I think it's my obligation as an Indonesian also to talk about this, right? Um, so uh, of course the Papuan have raised their voices uh, strongly, but I think it's also important to champion Indonesian who also are aware of this. Um, and um, it will be very difficult because the um, the situation right now with Papuan uh, as a religious minority, ethnic minority, also have to talk, uh, have to deal with this um, political power um, that are not necessarily friendly to them. So it's hard, but I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe you can <laughs> give me some ideas. <laughs> maybe we can do it together. Yeah. <laughs> That's what this, this initiative is about, is about sort of exchanging some ideas, right? So um, uh, we have a, uh, a two questions actually from um, your fellow postdoc, uh, Jessica Sudirgo. Um, so I'll, I'll let you answer hers uh, uh, just in one go. Um, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, the first question is, does the racial dimension of Papua's nationalist movement differentiate itself from other nationalist movements in, in Indonesia, such as Aceh or Timor-Leste? And the second question is, um, you've shown uh, the interesting ways that Papuans identify with a transnational black consciousness. Uh, what about in Indonesia across regional lines, for example, Maluku? So I'll, I'll just let you answer those two. Thank you, Jessica. This uh, question are very perceptive. And um, okay, so the first question regarding the the racial dimension, yes, it definitely distinguishes them from the Aceh Free Movement or even the South Molucas uh, RMS yeah, uh, Free Movement and East Timor. I think for East Timor, it's, it's quite it's quite clear that it, it was an invasion um, in West Papua as, as well according to part one. But I think in the, um, the different, and that plays a role. I think it, this is how part one think about, about the Aja case. Why Aja can sit to, could sit together in Helsinki, in Helsinki with the Indonesian government. Why Indonesian government do, doesn't want to talk to us? So that's the race, racial dimension, like what's wrong with the with us, right? So, um, I think it's quite clear that the Papuan uh, independent movement distinguished themselves from other, uh, what we call, separatist or secessionist movement in Indonesia precisely because of the race um, first. Secondly, also because of the history, right? The history that uh, it wasn't through a democratic referendum that uh, Papua, uh, West Papua joined Indonesia. So in those two, I mean, they have like several layers of argument uh, to argue to uh, for Indonesia. So, for instance, the history, of course, very important. Secondly, racial dimension, um, and uh, that speak to the second question. Like, uh, 
do they uh, identify themselves with the, the regional affiliation, even if they uh, suffer the same, sometimes suffer the same racial discrimination in Indonesia? No, because as you as uh, I show earlier during the colonial, the Dutch and Indonesian colonial period, or Indonesian uh, Indonesian rule, uh, in Indonesian, particularly from the east, the Molucas, the Minahasa, the Flores, are the mediator of this rule. So for instance, in the church, a lot of church official, minister, pastor, are from Flores and from Maluku, and they participate in the Indonesian power, right? So for Papua, they have a very, they have a very strong sense uh, of their identity precisely because of, because of how they read this racial hierarchy. So for them, the highest is the Japanese, of course, the Japanese, the people from Java. But then the interface of, of, of Indonesian rule in, in West Papua um, are the Molukas, the K for, for Catholic Church, Ambon from, for the Protestant Church, and then Minahasa, Toraja, uh, BBM also um, in the marketplaces. Um, so it's very hard for them actually like to identify themselves with this uh, Eastern, what you call Eastern Indonesian in West Papua. But in Indonesia, in Yogyakarta or in Surabaya, sometimes they, they feel some sense of solidarity because um, they suffer from the same colorism, right? In, in Yogyakarta, for instance, because they are slightly darker, um, they are discriminated against. So, uh, but for, to some extent, I think Papua are quite clear about what they, are, what they wanted. Uh, that's independent and Flores or Molucan people do not share their aspiration. So, so. Okay, great. Uh, so we have a question from our second year master's in Asian studies student, Jane Cox. Uh, thank you so much for that nuanced and informative presentation. You talked a little about how Papuans have multiple identities as black, indigenous, and Christian. Can you speak a little bit more about uh, as to how Indonesian identity and tribal differences interplay with racial and religious identity. And then a second question um, from Suyanto Widaya. Uh, thank you for a comprehensive uh, presentation. Given the details you provided from history all the way to the current situation, what is your suggestion to the Indonesian community and government to solve the racial problems that uh, are still going on in Papua? Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the question. So uh, the intersection of religion and race, um, I think due to the influence of the mission, American evangelical mission and uh, Dutch mission, uh, Christian, uh, I mean, Protestant and Catholic, uh, maybe 88% of indigenous population, no more, I think 90% of indigenous population are Christian. Um, and that's the problem when uh, a lot of the migrants from Indonesia who moved to West Papua to look for better chance um, are mostly Muslims. Um, so, uh, and there's a competition between Indonesian migrants and Papuan, uh, indigenous Papuan in terms of like economic access, uh, access to bureaucracy, access to fun and access to school, etc. And Papuan feel uh, highly marginalized by, by this competition. Um, so for instance, of course, in the marketplaces in the East Indonesia in general, um, the uh, um, trade, uh, trade at, uh, trading ethnic group uh, from Sulawesi like dominate the marketplaces. And it become a, a kind of a, a very uh, contested in, in, in the country, in, in West Papua. But I think the, the pressing problem right now is the arrival of a, of a particular strand of uh, Islamic radicalism uh, to West Papua. So West Papua is now considered, you know, on the frontier of Dakwah for uh, for this group. Uh, it's not uh, uh, it's not uh, all Muslim group. Like NU and Muhammadiyah also have a strong basis there, but the one that uh, the Papuan uh, are afraid of is the the kind of the Salafi type. Um, and the problem with this is that the Indonesian security forces sometimes work with with the, this Muslim group. Uh, to quell the, the to quell the in, uh, independence aspiration. So they put, for instance, the ormas that I mentioned before, and in Yogyakarta also, the ormas is um, 
like FBI or you know like the uh, Islamic Defendant Front or this kind of you know paramilitary Islamic group. So, so religious dimension is very strong, um, and uh, we can talk a lot about this. Uh, and a uh, lot of people actually are worried about what's going on after this. If uh, if uh, if um, the security forces continue to work with this radical group, um, so that's the, the 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 short answer to that. And then the secondly, the uh, suggestion for <laughs> the Indonesian government <laughs> first I have to recognize that there is racism <laughs> first. Secondly, I think to open up a dialogue with the Papuan. I think they have to, I think uh, the Papuan have asked for this, for the peaceful dialogue instead of uh, deployment of the military, military forces to West Papua. I think uh, what we, what Papua needs is peace, uh, peace and dialogue to talk about their future within Indonesia or outside Indonesia. So I think if, if uh, the government uh, wanted to uh, to make peace with the Papua, and they have to start with this this dialogue process. Um, and I think uh, Papua have designated their representative, uh, United Liberation Movement of West Papua or MRP. And I think this the question now is in the Indonesian government whether they want it or not. Uh, so if you guys or Indonesian want to push for this, I think, the first thing is like to push the government to have better policy on West Papua. So, okay. Okay. Uh, so we have just a few minutes. So I'm going to uh, give three last uh, questions. Um, so the first is from Sade Bimantara. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask the question. Um, so cases of violence um, are challenged throughout Indonesia, including in Papua and West Papua. A study in 2018 by the Lowy Institute found that armed groups uh, were actually involved in killings, um, uh, you know, not not sort of Indonesian security forces, right? Uh, such mm -hmm. killings include the murders of 19 road workers by, in Nduga mm -hmm. uh, by groups mm -hmm. affiliated with the United Liberation Movement from West Papua. Uh, yeah. There's also other violence attributed to tribal warfare and political violence. How do you propose uh, for the government and communities to jointly address this challenge. Um, yeah. Second one is um, it's a very uh, from Naila Majestia, a very fascinating presentation and eye-opening even for uh, Indonesians, uh, since trusted uh, information about West Papua uh, is not easily accessible, if not intentionally censored. Uh, so I recently heard some sentiment in the mediated uh, Papuan Lives Matter movement about a concern regarding the Islamization of West Papua. Can you tell me what prompts this sentiment? Um, mm -hmm. And then the last question is uh, from Emily Abraham. Um, do you know the extent to which the story of people in Jayapura encountering African-American service members during the 1940s is well known or remembered? Um, also, uh, could you uh, comment a little bit more about some of the groups being funded by China Thank you. Okay. So All right. very quickly, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. All right. The, yes. So uh, yeah. So we have to recognize as well that the uh, the independent uh, the independent group also kill uh, many Indonesian civilian and military uh, uh, military official as well. Uh, and this is this is the consequences of the very militarized uh, and conflict prone area. So I think uh, we have to end this this conflict. We have to end the security approach in West Papua. I think uh, the, the government has said that they are committed to human rights approach and I think it's, it's very good uh, and we have to push for that. Not only in the in Bapenas, uh, as you know, but also in the ministry of uh, coordinating minister of uh, forest and uh, security, but KSP. I think the Indonesian government has to have one say about what they plan for West Papua. They cannot do both things, right? Like you say welfare approach, but you also commit to security approach. You cannot do both things because Papuan are very critical on that. Uh, so I think. Uh, if the government, the Indonesian government or the president himself committed to resolve the Papuan issue, then we have to, uh, Indonesian have to gain their trust uh, and how to gain their trust to 
fully committed to peaceful dialogue. I think that's the only uh, suggestion that I have. Um, and then um, secondly, but I recognize that uh, that the, the situation with Papua is really bad, that both sides uh, have killed each other and this, this cannot go on, I think. Um, and it has been like more than 50 years, the longest conflict in Indonesia. Second, um, Islamization, yes. So actually uh, to be, uh, uh, Islam has been embraced by Papua in the uh, sense uh, even 16th century. So in Fakfak in the Western part in Raja Ampat, a lot of Papua are Muslim. And uh, uh, Papua themselves, I think mostly are not concerned about, the, about Islam, Islam or indigenous Islam. But I think what they are concerned uh, about is this very specific uh, type of uh, radical Islam that just arrived in places like Jayapura, in Koya, in, in Kerong. And not because they uh, aggressively like committed uh, or um, carry out dakwa, uh, which is like evangelical also do the same thing. <laughs> but it's just because uh, this group uh, has the backup of the security forces. So for instance, one of the, of the Ustad or the Islamic leader uh, in Koya, <laughs> uh, I think it's burn or, uh, burn or destroy the Christmas decoration. And for Papua, Christmas is like big thing. It's not nothing to do with the Christian. They sometimes they don't go to the church as well. <laughs> but it's just like you know, like very festive celebration. And then this Ustad um, uh, destroy the decoration. And then when uh, the Papua uh, complained to the police, the police defended the, the this cleric, right? The the Ustad. So it's not uh, it's not only about Islam, but Islam that is intersect with economic and political domination. So I think we have to understand that, that it's not only about Islam, but Islam that's uh, with, uh, with economic and political domination. Um, so the coercion uh, is there. And I'm hoping to, to learn more about this uh, next semester. <laughs> okay, that's uh, my short answer. Uh, but we'll have to, to talk more about that uh, privately. And then Emily, um, so the role seconds. of- uh, <laughs> Okay, African-American, um, so, all the name in the in Jayapura actually come from from the from the U.S. Army, like the Dog Sembilan, Dog, all um, uh, APO. So um, the legacy is very strong in 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 in, in West Papua. Um, that's physical uh, legacy, but also you know this imagination about African American liberation. Uh, Black Panther is uh, is quite well known, and Chris and I think Black uh, Black. American Black Christianity plays very strong role. And then the organization is called the Melanesian Sperhetu. It's a regional group, it's funded by China. Um, so you can check on their uh, Wikipedia page, I think. Thank you. Well, wonderful. Uh, this has been really educational for, uh, I can speak for myself, but I also uh, believe for all of uh, the people who have attended, um, particularly since we just know so little about uh, this case, but this case is not just about uh, this particular region in Indonesia or even about Asia. It's about um, how we're going to deal with a lot of the issues of, of race, ethnicity, uh, the legacies of colonization as well. So uh, this has been very use useful for all of us to hear and fascinating. Um, and we look forward to uh, future uh, events uh, with you uh, and Dr. C. Diego as well um, uh, in, in this Southeast Asia uh, uh, Ethnic and Religious Conflict Initiative. Um, so again, thank you uh, for the fascinating presentation and thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, all the best. Thank you for having me, thank you.